This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Late Boomers, our podcast guide to creating your third act with style, power, and impact. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. And I'm Mary Elkins. Join us as we bring you conversations with successful entrepreneurs, entertainers, and people with vision who are making a difference in the world. Everyone has a story, and we'll take you along for the ride on each interview, recounting the journey our guests have taken to get where they are, inspiring you to create your own path to success. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. Welcome to Late Boomers. Today, our special guest is author Linda Goldman, whose book, Breaking Out of Pinewood, has become a bookseller's featured choice and national book club sensation. And I'm Mary Elkins. Linda worked as a disgruntled secretary, those are her words, before opening her own employment agency in her late 30s, graduated UCLA in sociocultural I can say that, sociocultural anthropology in her 40s, worked as a dispute resolution professional in her 50s, and began writing in her 60s. Breaking Out of Pinewood is her first novel. Welcome, Linda, to Late Boomers. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Linda, can you tell us how your background (laughs) influenced your life as a writer and your stories? Um, sure. Um, well, first of all, I've always loved a a good story, good storytellers. My father could tell a great joke and I've always been interested in various cultures and, you know, just learning about people. I had kind of a, a crazy, uh, young adult life. I lived in London. I lived in New York. And uh, my husband was English, so there were lots of uh, lots of new information and new experiences coming in all the time. Mm-hmm. I um, the 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 book is really um, placed in a, a little town up in Colorado, and my husband and I had a, a house in a small town in Colorado, and wow. it's kind of based on that town but everything in the book is fictitious except for perhaps sandy Sandy, you know at the beginning of a but yeah you took a long route to get to where you are so um how did you happen to like for instance how'd you end up at ucla when you're in your 40s that's so interesting to me in socio and socio what is it socioeconomic sociocultural sociocultural well um I was a single mom and I raised my kids from the time they were one and three till the time they were 18 and 20. I remarried or I remarried then. Um, and so I was responsible for them, you know, and making a living and so forth all those years. Then after I married my second husband, um, I quit my employment agency, I think much to his dismay, to be honest, and went back to school. I always wanted to, you know, Uh have more education, but I was not in a position to do it, raising my kids. And I kind of had ants in my pants when I was young, couldn't settle down Mm. and finish college. Uh Oh, I get it. (laughs) Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, Well, Talking about your book, Breaking Out of Pinewood, would you give our audience a thumbnail sketch of of the storyline? Hmm. Okay, let's see. Well, Wait, it's not too many sto- spoilers. No, yeah, no, no spoilers. I, yeah, she knows well, how to do that. <laughs> I hope so. Well, <laughs> it it starts out with a young girl with just a parents that just cannot figure out how to be parents. It was a shotgun marriage. They were very young. And so she's kind of has to uh, find her way in life. And although she's more adult than her parents in certain ways, she she just really doesn't know how to negotiate her way through. So she kind of gets attracted to some not so terrific people. And it's <laughs> it's kind of a wild story. Um, totally. With crazy characters. <laughs> um. 
I, I really had a lot of fun naming the characters. I paid a lot of attention to how the name fit the character. And that, oh, was, that was a lot of fun for me. Tell um, us about that a, a bit. Yeah, I think that's oh, great. Well, like, for example, I won't go into why, but Angela ends up becoming, shortening her name to Angel. And there was a real reason for that. A, a lot of ha having to do with the trouble she keeps getting into. And wow. I, the woman that owns the cafe is Faye Vespers. And Vespers is like a, kind of a jazz performance in churches, like on Sunday afternoons. Right. And her first name, Faye, is almost like Faith. And so she is a very, she's probably the most kind, decent, wonderful person in the story. So oh. um, I wanted her name to reflect that. Mm -hmm. um, How fun. Later, yeah, later on there's an Arthur, which is, you know, I mean, not to be disparaging about anybody named Arthur, but a little more of an uptight name <laughs> than some of the other characters in the book. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, there, and there are more. You know, there are more. I, 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 I thought carefully about each name. And is yeah. Pinewood a real place? Pinewood is not a real place, except in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I, when I was came up with the name, I was looking for other Pinewood cities, and I think there's only one in the country somewhere in the south. There mm. are country clubs named Pinewood. There are camps named pinewood there are all Makes kinds sense. of things named yeah but but it, pinewood um is not a real place it's up supposed to be up in the um rockies in colorado and there are two other towns called copperville and geiger um i was gonna ask geiger about those Springs. those aren't real either yeah. no those, geiger those Springs, are your inventions yeah in, yeah geiger springs is pretty much uh, based location wise, not that the reader would know unless they know the area based on Glenwood Springs and yeah. Copperville is a fictionalized version of Carbondale. Ah, they've been to both nice. Places. I like those names, creative <laughs> names. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so tell, tell us, are any of your characters based on real people or real events that happened? The only one uh, that's anything like a real person that I know is Sandy. The way she flips her hair around and the, and the good friend that she is is based on a friend of mine that lives in Carbondale. Um, everybody else is a complete work of fiction. Some of the names are based on people. There's a character, Big Martha, who is based on my writing teacher who's not big at all. <laughs> Um, but I just thought it would be fun to plug her name into the book somewhere. Um, the, the parents are named, um, Jerry and Grace, and those are my, my cousin Grace and her husband, Jerry. Oh. But the only, the reason, only reason I named them that is not because they're anything like my cousin and her long deceased husband, but because the character is so ungraceful and she's so uncouth that I thought the name Grace would be funny for her. Nothing like the character. Are you working with quite a bit of humor in the book then? You have to ask Mary. I <laughs> well, Mary's so. read it and I haven't read it. So I'm at a disadvantage. I just wonder if there's a lot of I don't tell. Uh, funny I don't stuff. Tell, at, least, at least on a podcast. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, you can say if there's humor. Well, it's I mean, hilarious, actually. I think oh. there's so much in it that's totally funny. I mean, I just catch myself going giggling and I think oh but Linda's very funny Linda and I by ah. the way for our audience have known each other for two or three I don't know I was gonna say like how many years okay, I don't know five or six maybe four three maybe or four. four yeah oh but it, not that anyway I have to ask you more about your characters because I'd like to know if they aren't based on real people how did you come up with them they're so complicated in so many ways or they they look so they feel so real and i'm oh, wondering I'm so how did you do that how did you go into developing them well it took a lot first of all it took me 10 years to write this book and wow. um when i first started writing i really didn't know how to write to be honest and 
So as I was writing it, I was learning how to write. <laughs> so I get that. Not that, I, not that there isn't tons to learn. There always is. And I don't claim to be finished with learning how to write. But um, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, when people ask me, did you write every morning? Did you have a routine? No. It was very haphazard. And uh, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend approaching something that way. But I would not look at it for a few days, and then I would sit down and write for six or seven hours straight with all of a sudden realizing the room was dark. You know, um, sometimes mm -hmm. I would leap out of bed with an idea and go, oh, you know, I like that phrase or something like that. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and I don't think. Yeah. See, um, well, I, I just want to uh, elaborate, a, you to know, elaborate a bit because. In reading the book, which is so fun, and the characters are so outrageous, and maybe there's a part of you I don't know or haven't met yet, but how did you write about people whose lives have nothing in common with yours? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. I I don't know anybody like those people except for Sandy. Um, other than that, I just let them tell me who they were, which I know sounds kind of strange, but honestly, um, I just don't know. I think it, it all started with uh, a cartoon in The New Yorker. The whole idea of this book came from a cartoon in The New Yorker. And if you don't mind, I'll explain it to you a little bit. Sure, it's um, it's, I still laugh when I see it. I did get a copy of it, a signed copy of it. Oh, good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. But um, it was four women, young women. You can tell the driver of this car has got a pert little blonde ponytail. She's got a scarf across her face, sunglasses, and she looks young. And the, she's with three other girls in the car. Two of them have a gun out the window, and one of them has a money bag on her lap. There's a bank in the background. So clearly, they just robbed the bank. And the mm -hmm. uh, the caption is, and to think we started as a book group. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. You're going to give every book group out there some ideas. <laughs> well, I just thought it was so funny. And this Love that. Uh, women in, I know it's so funny. So that started it. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I just maybe thought I'd write a little short story. And then I thought, I need, why? How did it get to this? Who are these people? What were the parents like? Where did they live? You know, how mm -hmm. do these girls get to that? And um, <laughs> it it just took off from there. It just That's took great. off from there. there yeah. There was put... all, I'm sorry. That's no, okay. Continue. Okay. Um, well, there's also a song by Ava Cassidy, Eva Cassidy, if you know who she is. And she um, sang a song that honestly breaks, I break down every time I hear it. Maybe not as much as I used to, but it's called Gas Station Mountain Home. Hmm. And it's about this young girl who's, that's where she lives. She's already got three kids. She's very young. And all she wants to do is see the city lights. They must shine so bright. And she's trapped. She's trapped. Her husband drinks too much. It's a song. It's a country song. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That helped me understand part of my character and the choices that she made, good or bad or otherwise. And breaking out of Pinewood, that's what she wants to do from the very, very beginning of the book, first chapter. She wants to get out of there. Mm -hmm. This character in the song influenced my thinking. I thought about that song a lot, quite a lot. Well, Did that's you play great. It while you wrote? Pardon me? Did you play it while you wrote? No, no, I didn't. I didn't, but I thought about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of gave you motivation. But you didn't start writing till your 60s. So what motivated you to start writing then? Um, well, life had changed and I, I wasn't working anymore. 
And, you know, a lot of times when, you know, people retire, what am I going to do? What do I want to do? What have I always wanted to, you know, mm. just start trying to figure out where to go next. And a very uh, talented friend of mine is an artist and a writer was telling me about a particular writing workshop. And I said, you know, mm. I think I'd like to give that a try. I'd never, the only writing I'd ever done before was um, for my business, just ads, you mm -hmm. know, which was fun because you've got to, they've got to be very punchy, yeah. right? And grabs, but it doesn't give you much in terms of those skills. <clears throat> Excuse me. Discipline. Um, and, but I will say I had a piece published when I was in the third grade and it was all about silkworms. And it was in the PTA newsletter. So <laughs> my first piece was published at eight, and the la the next piece was published at. <laughs> old. You're not gonna say, but did you? <laughs> so that's what you wrote early in life. But that's it, huh? Yeah, one little what thing. When I was eight years old. Well, what was the inspiration to write this book then? What hit What hit you over the head that made you do it? Well, um, it was that cartoon, you know, it got me going. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I was writing other things in class. Um, you were writing and it was poetry, a workshop, right? So I, you were writing poetry? Pardon me? You were writing poetry? Not, I've done a little poetry. It's not really what I'm attracted to um, for myself. I don't think that's for me particularly. Um, but. I don't know. Just once I got going on this, it just kept building and building. Yeah, do and your do your care? I mean, you were saying this all just came to you. Do you. So many writers just sit there and they say these characters appear almost in video to them. Is that what happened to you, or did they speak in voices to you? How did that work? A, a little of each. I'm more of a visual person. I didn't write this as a movie, um, but I see it. As, I saw it as a movie as I was writing it. I'm much more visual uh, than anything else. And I would just see these. I mean, I would just see Angela. Angela was a little bit, or quite a bit, her personality, her um, very, very um, strong sense of, a tra how do I say it? Just men would always be very, their heads would snap around when they saw her type thing from the time I'm talking about my character, when she was a young girl <laughs> all the way through. But she, part of her was based on my business partner, uh, who was just a very, very unusual looking in the sense that not classically beautiful, but she had tawny skin. She had strawberry blonde hair, big brown eyes and a killer body. and. Uh, she was, she had a wild streak. She was really, really fun. She was really fun. Uh, and it was a little bit for me paying homage to her, you know, oh. even mm -hmm. though they, I talk about her looking like Anne Margaret, she, you know, I thought that was relatable for people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was the hardest part of your book to write? Um, Anything having to do with legal procedure, courtroom procedures, it just was so hard for me. I I really, really, really resisted learning about it. I kind of skipped from one thing and jumped over that. And I thought, I've got to write about it. It's really important. So I had to go to the library and I honestly was sweating. I just, I oh, wanted I was to get it right. I going to ask you about the research involved. Sounds like there was quite a bit, right? There actually was, even though it's a lighthearted book and it's a romp. I, that's how I describe it, a romp. Um, first of all, yes, the courtroom stuff and all of that was really, really hard. Um, and I, towards the end of the book, I don't want to give, Mary, you'll know because you said you read it, but uh, some another world I knew nothing about. And I, I spent hours and hours and hours of research and listening to um, blogs or uh, vlogs or whatever you call them. And um, I, you know, I wanted it to sound authentic and 
it was very interesting to do that. I even did research, you know, on vernacular, you know, slang of the time and things like that. Yeah. The way things looked. It takes place in the 60s, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any reason why you chose then? I mean, was it relatable or um, why? Well, it's because it would just, first of all, there's a lot of musical references there because music's always been a really important part of my life. And I think, you know, so I'm very familiar with that music. And those are my growing up years, you mm-hmm. know, so I could, it was just easier for me to understand and to relate to myself in order to know my character Mm-hmm. You know, since mm-hmm. she was complete, she was not a fictionalized version of me. So I had to do whatever yeah. I could do to make myself comfortable. You know, you know what I would so, be your re- what would be your recommendations for other people who want to complete a book or a big project? Do you have like advice? I do. You do um, good. I do stay away from social media. Ah, yeah. I've never been a big television watcher, even now when there's so much good content. I never have. And so it w- was easier for me. I didn't have to mm-hmm. tear myself away from a favorite program or something like that. But um, anything like that is a huge distraction. And the more you leave space, you know, because my experience, and I'm sure it's true for so many people that have written a book fiction Mm -hmm. or nonfiction, you need, you sort of need the space in your head. You need to just let it kind of live inside of you. You're not just writing when you um, sit down in front of a laptop or your computer, you can be writing something just in your mind when you wake up in the morning or in the middle of the night, right? Middle of the night, you jump out of bed, you know? Um, So, and I, I would say that's, a big one, you know, um, oh. I can't, I mean, I think it's great when people develop a, a regular writing routine. I think it's probably terrific. It's just not me, uh, mm-hmm. my personality, but, um, the other part of it is just to take it a day at a time. Don't project all the way to worrying about the finished product. Enjoy it and submerge yourself and live in it and just take it for what it is and just, you know, not worry about how it'll, how it'll end. Even if you have rewritten, you've written the end already, which I did not, I did not. I just let it go and go, Oh, okay. This is where it's going. So there are different ways, you know, with the the approach, but I would just say, just sink in and enjoy it as much as you can. And, It'd be a lot more easy and not such drudgery. It's not that I didn't have tough times or, you know, blocks. At t- of course I did, you know, and things that I just had to throw out pages going, no, no did good. You, did you throw out a lot of it? Did you have to rewrite a lot of it? I was rewriting as I went, mm. you know, I'd mm. go back and i go, nah. I would fix a phrase. I would fix something. I had to throw out at the end, working with an editor, about 35 pages. um, Killed me. (laughs) But but it did, but it didn't, because you know how much work that is. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. it was okay, because it was the right thing to do. It needed to move faster at the beginning. Yeah. And then I just rewrote another chapter where I had to change the whole twist where I didn't want, I wanted this person to be a questionable character. And I turned her by suggestion into a good person and that worked better. That's what writing is all about. You've got to be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's that's true. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So you're, you're, it can be painful. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, you're self-published, but I want, I'd like to know what your thoughts are about self-publishing versus getting an agent and trying for one of the big vibes, or even going for an indie publisher? I'm not uh, the best person to ask about these hybrid publishers, 
Um, I went to a writing conference last year and I realized, even though I knew at some level, there were a lot of agents there and things like that. You could have these quick little 10 minute speed dating type interviews with them. I met with three of them and then there was a panel of them. And I realized right then and there that it could be years before I got an agent or it may never happen. And I could be waiting and waiting and waiting for years. And then once you have the agent, it can be years before a publisher is interested or maybe they never are. Mm. And um, mm -hmm. I just thought, I don't have that kind of time. I don't have the patience. I think that um, I did the right thing for me. I could still be sitting here waiting, you know, for letters. <laughs> oh, God, I am. Um, true. Yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I still could. And the thing is, too, it seems to me just in the, even the past five years, and believe me, I don't claim to be an expert on this, that self-publishing is much, much more widely accepted. I always felt that I wanted that validation. This is good enough where a publisher wants it, you know. But in actual fact, it's there are a lot of things that are being widely read and widely accepted that are self-published. And um, I'm comfortable with that. I would just say, in my experience, I'm not a great detail-oriented person. And so I worked with somebody that helped me get there. You know, I paid somebody to help me to do the final editing. She had all kinds of suggestions. And um, and then there's the marketing part after. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about that. How hard is it to market your book? I mean, you have to market yourself too. Yeah, well, part of the answer to that is that unless you're a big name author, you have to market it yourself anyway. They don't go to bat for every single person. They'll yeah. go to bat mm -hmm. for the big name people or somebody, they'll identify one book that they say this is, and they'll put all their energy behind that one thing like, I think lessons in chemistry might have been a perfect example of that. Yeah. And mm. you can see why they put their energy behind it. It was really yeah. it was good. Oh yeah. Fabulous. But um it's it's only it's as hard uh, you know, I know a lot of creative people are not good at marketing themselves. And it's like the the other side of themselves that they just can't, you know, lock into. I understand that. Right. Because, yeah, because I had my own business, you know, for um, 12 years. I I know how to do that a little bit. But there's there's a whole other world of, you know, social media things and reading mm -hmm. at bookstores. and You're doing. Yeah. yeah. There's more about, there's more. I mean, people can set, I haven't. And I don't think I will start a whole Facebook page just for their book. You know, things that I oh, have done. Can, all that. But you can. Are you on Instagram? She is. Vaguely. Vaguely, <laughs> so you're not posting. All the time. You're not posting all about the book on Instagram? No? I, I should. I will. But yeah, yeah it's real, not... real easy to set up a Facebook page and then just add a post every week on there to oh. like remind oh. people to read it. And then Real it simple. goes direct to Instagram, right? If you if you allow well, it to, well, it could. Yeah, yeah, it could. Okay. Yeah. Well, and Linda, what would you like our audience to have as a takeaway today? Well, if if the people that are listening or viewing are you know writing a book or want to write a book or just stay with it. I have to tell you, it is absolutely the most amazing thing to see what you've been working on for years between two covers as a finished product. It is Yay. just, it's the most incredible. It's like giving birth. I mean, that's not the newest uh, thought in the world, but it truly is. <laughs> and it you have truly a is. Cover, by the way. Thank you. What? Should I show what? it? Yeah, show yeah. it. Sure. The listeners can't hear it. I know. You're not breaking in the out of, of pine wood with the motorcycle and uh, 
uh, the ace of hearts and um yeah what else yeah that's basically it yeah yeah just you know i would say the other takeaway is it's really important to stay open and to listen to editors but make sure you get the right editor that you trust and you believe in. They're not all great. I can tell you there was one that I worked with who was saying how much she liked my work. And I'm like, yes. And I needed her expertise. She didn't give me much. And other ones that I work with seem to be more oriented towards content, which is great. And others more oriented towards punctuation. So if you work, with an editor, find out which sort of editor they are, unless they do all of it, but ask the question, I didn't know, I didn't know, you know. You, you were kind of trial and error on that, huh? Everything, <laughs> everything, <laughs> Gabby. <laughs> right? Try one, trial then error. move on. Move I on. didn't know. Yeah. 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 Well, the other thing I, you I had a like good to, end result. Yeah. Well, I hope right. so. What but, else were you going to say? Oh, well, I just wanted to share one another thing. Uh oh, did a slip away from me? Oh, yes. I had one editor who was really good on content. She told me there were things in my book that weren't politically correct. And she said, this just won't fly right now. And I started to change them. And I said to myself, you know what? I want them there. I like it. This took place in the 60s and 70s. People use different language, had different thoughts, different ideas. Mm -hmm. The cultural, the whole culture was different at that time. Yeah. It wasn't written for today. And I went back to my original. I'm happy that I did. And I think people really have to know themselves and have confidence in themselves about what to keep and what to let go of. And it can be challenging. Mm, that's great excellent that's advice wonderful advice thank you so much our guest today on late boomers has been linda goldman author of the terrific book breaking out of pinewood you can reach linda at plentiful press at gmail.com and you can buy her book at amazon and barnes and noble and all brick and mortar stores thank you and we want to thank our listeners for subscribing to our podcast and checking us out on youtube and recommending us to your friends. We appreciate you and we'd love to have you give us a five-star review. And we want to hear about your experiences with late boomers and what gets you inspired. We are on Instagram at I am Kathy Worthington, at I am Mary Elkins, and at Late Boomers. Thank you for listening. And thanks again, Linda. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. We really enjoyed talking with both of you. Thanks so much. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on Late Boomers, the podcast that is your guide to creating a third act with style, power, and impact. Please visit our website and get in touch with us at lateboomers.biz. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes of Late Boomers, go to EWNpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most other major podcast sites. We hope you make use of the wisdom you've gained here and that you enjoy a successful third act with your own style, power, and impact. <laughs>